Good morning, all. Did you say I was yelling? <laughs> You'll know when I'm yelling. <laughs> because my voice is amplified by a public address system. <laughs> Good morning, all. Good morning. Everyone doing well? Yeah. Glad to hear it. Welcome to the Fairgrounds Road Church of Christ Sunday morning Bible study. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Glad to see all of you who are here uh, in the sanctuary and certainly all who are joining us via Facebook Live. We're always happy to have you with us as well. We hope, trust, and pray that all is well with you in your lives and um, you're happy, healthy, and at peace. How do you feel this morning? Pretty good. good. Pretty good. Good. There's two people. <laughs> Better than I was. Better than what? Than I was. Than you were? Okay. All right. Good. I'm genuinely concerned. That's why I'm asking. Because you know when we have a tendency, we say, ah, oh, well, I'm here. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Think of all the other places that you could be, right? <laughs> but you were in the house of the Lord on the day of the Lord for the purposes of worshiping the Lord. I just, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? This is heaven practice. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Because when we make it to heaven, what do you think we're going to be doing? Right. Amen. Right. So get it in and get good at it now. <laughs> All right. Uh, we are continuing on in our study of Daniel chapter 4. Uh, I think that's where we are, chapter 4. Did you guys last week get through the uh, furnace and the fourth person that was in the fire? And We finished Daniel. No. <laughs> we finished Daniel. Good try. Good try. Now, you lawyers, you guys might want to back up because what just happened in church... <laughs> That's, that's not up to me. That's between her and God. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, great, great. And, uh, and, and so Doug stood in for us. I, I had to be in Houston last week, and there was a flight issue. So I called Doug and said, can you stand in? And he said, yes. And so he fast-forwarded the tape past where I wanted to be. But <laughs> of course he did. He did. Uh, and Nathaniel did a wonderful job with the sermon as well. So I appreciate both those guys. But um, before we get into our study for today, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to be able to come to you in prayer and knowing that you are the creator of all things. You are the almighty, the alpha and the omega, and we would not exist without you. We just thank you, Father, for all the ways that you care for us, the ways that you love us, uh, the ways that you put up with us, Father. For we know that there are times that we don't do the things that we're supposed to do or do the things that we aren't supposed to. And we just thank you, Father, for not snatching the life out of us. Uh, we know that was the fate of Ananias and Sapphira, and uh, that could easily go for any of us. Nevertheless, Father, you are long-suffering with us and uh, allow us to continue to go on and uh, to make corrections and to uh, continue to seek your face in all things. This morning, Father, we pray for this world. We know that uh, a million people have died from this COVID. Uh, it's just an ever-present thing, and it affects every aspect of our lives. We know that we're not rid of it yet, Father, but we pray that we will soon be. And we know that you have the power and the ability. We know that you can. We just pray, Father, that you will. Uh, we ask, Father, that you would be with all those who are suffering from um, this dreaded disease, whether they are uh, infected by it themselves or um, have family members, loved ones that are infected. And of course, Father, we want to hold up the President of the United States, who is himself and his wife uh, affected by this disease, that you would uh, bring healing to them, Father. Uh, no one should uh, be subject to this, but there are so many who are, and we pray for them all, not just the President, but certainly the President as well. Uh, Father, we also pray for the unrest that is going on. We pray for the unemployment situation, the economy, just so many different things that are going on. Nevertheless, we have reason to praise you. Uh, 
uh, as we always will, because you caused us to rise this morning. You woke us up out of a slumber. Uh, you caused us to be clothed and in our right mind, as the Bible talks about, and to be able to come to this place for the purposes of worshiping you. And we thank you so much for that. Uh, while we can talk about all that is negative and uh, dark in this world, we can certainly talk about all the positives and the brightness as well. Uh, so we thank you for our lives such as they are. We thank you for love. We thank you for compassion. We thank you um, just for the air that we breathe. And we thank you most of all for your precious son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, that we uh, will not have to suffer a second death, Father. So we ask that you would be with us on this day, as all days, uh, as we study another portion of your word. Help us, Father, to understand those things that have been uh, preserved for us. Uh, and let us not just hear them this morning, but let's understand them and let's internalize them and then allow them, Father, to influence and affect our behavior in ways that would uh, cause us to be able to, pro to, to produce fruit. Um, that's our goal. That's our desire as your children. Uh, be with us this day. Be with those who are, uh, desire to be here uh, for purposes of worship but are providentially hindered from being so. Uh, be with those of our number who are traveling. Uh, we know that uh, Andrew and Sophie and the kids are going to be gone for a little bit. And we pray that you would be with them. Uh, we want to keep uh, um, Gail and Joan uh, in front of you and all of those who have been unable yet, Father, to um, not rejoin us physically, uh, but continue to be with us virtually. Uh, again, just bless us, Father. Uh, help us today understand your word and accept those things that we offer in love in the spirit that they are given. We pray this in all things, in the precious and powerful name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Let us all say, Amen. 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 All right. Um, what I normally do is, you know what, we're not going to talk about what I normally do. Let's go on to chapter 4 of the book of Daniel. <laughs> and uh, I am... 100% positive that Doug did a fantastic job with uh, the, 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 the fire and all that stuff, and so we'll just move forward from there. And we find ourselves now in chapter 4 where the king, and did you guys get into chapter 4 at all? You read some of it. I think you did. Just read some of it? Okay. So it well, we feel like it should be right. March we got that far, so we what now? It was so far, we thought it was March. Like, you thought it was March? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just read the green. So. You just read? Just read the green out of it. Okay. Right. All right. Okay. Oh, that sounds like the same teacher we had last week. <laughs> you guys ever um, taken a class from Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> Remember when I said there were all kinds of good things to praise God about? <laughs> praise God, hallelujah. Desiree is taking one for the team. All right. <laughs> the Bible says Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all the people, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. All right. So what we see here is a little soliloquy, if you will, a letter, a, 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 a and an expression from the king. Uh, I'd like to know two things. What's he saying and why? Shall I read it again? <laughs> yes, ma'am. If he's saying that about himself, he's setting himself about that. But he's not. He's saying it about God. He's having a humble moment. He is. Now, so I would, I would say also that, that um, 
He has, in the past, put himself above God. You, you recall? When he said to the three Hebrew boys, what God shall save you from my hand? Right? So you, you could easily interpret that as him putting himself above God. He says, there's no God out there that can save you from what I'm going to do to you if you don't do what I require of you. All right, this is what he said. Um, but you say he's having a humble moment. Tell me more. Please. Okay, okay. So he's not responding to the situation with the three Hebrew boys? Not in this letter, he's not. Okay, that's a very astute observation. So, so what's being said um, by Desiree is that he's about to go into a narrative about some things that have happened to him. And so this is a letter that is being written to whom? Everybody. Right? Um, all people, all nation, men of every language. Um, and of course, he identifies himself. And so in, in this ancient letter writing, and we see this even in the New Testament, where Paul would say, I, Paul, and I'm with Tychicus and whoever else, uh, to whoever I'm sending this to. Um, you identify self and you identify the addressees. And so with him being who he is, he has influence over a great number of people. And so I just imagine this being some, uh, some, some dictate that's gone out. I guess the modern equivalent would probably be Twitter, right? Where just everybody in the world, and I realize that not everybody subscribes to Twitter, but uh, there are many, many, many people who do. And even if you don't subscribe to Twitter, you've heard about something that's been said on Twitter. So the word gets out. And so he's trying to get the word out about what has happened to him, but he begins his remarks with praise of God, right? Capital G, um, not small g, not some other God, Yahweh, the God, the one true God. This is who he's talking about. Um, and he says that it seems good to him to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for him. Um, and again, I, I was going to ask, what does he mean by that? But we're going to get into that in just a moment. So what he's doing then, he says that I have reason, family. I have reason to share with you my experience with God. Did you all get that? I have reason to share with you my experience with God. I, I wonder, family, this morning, do any of us, have reason to share with anyone what God has done for us. Mm -hmm. What's my next question? No. Have you and are you? Have we and are we? Cindy, could you turn this up? I can't hear. No, no, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> She's looking for some knob to turn. <laughs> um, that's something that we have to think about, family, because, again, that's, that's our mission, is to, you may not know BCV. BCV. Do you know what that is? Chapter, I don't know what it is, but book, it is. Yeah, yeah. chapter, verse. Oh, okay. 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 Scriptural memorization. Yeah. You, you may not be able to do that. You may know broadly what the Bible says, but you may or may not be able to say, well, John chapter 3, verse 16 says. Mm -hmm. right? Which is fine, but you know broadly what's in it. Mm -hmm. but, but even if you can't direct someone to a specific scripture to make the point that you're trying to make, what you can do is what? Testimony. You said testimony? Give a testimony. Give a testimony. You can testify. You can witness to what God has done in your life. Is that right? Mm -hmm. All of us can do that, right? And, well, can all of us do that? There are things in our lives we cannot explain that have 
have only been by God. Right. right. So you need to tell people, I didn't do it. God had to have done it. I couldn't have done what happened. Right. Or I shouldn't be alive because of a situation. God saved me. Without a doubt. And you should share that. Absolutely. Right. And, and, and so we all have the capability to do that. Not just the capability, but the responsibility to do that. Now, this, in this area, you guys get a little quiet, and so that means that I'm getting next to you, and I don't want to do that to you this morning. Um, but that's always going to be my constant encouragement to all of us, myself included, because I go to the same grocery stores that you go to, and I interact with the same strangers that you interact with, and I have the same opportunities on jobs and in the neighborhood that you have to be able to share a testimony, right? And, and I don't always do what I should do either. And so it's a con I'm so this is not Lee standing up here beating up on you. I'm saying that we all can and should and must do a better job, especially in these times when there's such need and such despondency and so many people looking for answers. This is when we should be out front talking about who God is and what God has done in our lives. Yeah, it's interesting. I think we, we tend to think as uh, our testimony is our story. And I think that's a really, really bad way to think about it. Because mm -hmm. for the most part, people don't care about my story. They don't. They care about their story. And they are interested in how my story fits their story. And so when we think of testimony, I think we should think in terms of starting with listening and understanding and then adapting our story to address the pain, the hurt, the holes in their story. Uh, I, was, I was experiencing this with the guy, I was, uh, there's a couple that does my hair and you know, beard and stuff and I go occasionally and the man is a believer but he's not a Christian, he doesn't attend anywhere. And for some reason he kind of launched into his, this last time about his struggle with church and you know you're getting the typical hypocrisy and stuff it was a really good opportunity for me to really, I just sat and listened to his hurt and then when I decided to talk I fit my talk into his hurt and he responded really well to it mm -hmm. now if I had just cut him off and told him my story you know my testimony I would have just been another guy that was doing what others had done to him right and so so testimony includes, I, I think testimony is totally biblical, and I think we as a fellowship have not leveraged it to the extent that others have, mm -hmm. like in the Churches of Christ, we mm -hmm. tend to think it's a bad thing to give our testimony sometimes, I think, I don't mm -hmm. like that, but if our testimony can start with listening and understanding, because then we can actually fit this into it, even if we don't know book, chapter, and verse, right. we have to know it enough right. to adapt our testimony to their story. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? 100%. I, 100%. And so I would say that our points are, are, are um, complementary of one another. Uh, my, my assertion is that we must be willing to share. Mm -hmm. right? And I think what you're saying is that there's a way to share. Mm -hmm. So those two things don't contradict one another. I'm not making the, the, the point about how to go about it. Because I could also make the argument that when you find people who are in need, you meet their need first, and then maybe there's a testimony. Or you listen to what their issue is, and then there's a testimony. But by, by the time we get down to the end of it, if you're interacting with someone, consider sharing a lot, right? However, you, you do that. Okay? And meeting the need is testimony. Certainly. Just, you can't stop there. They have to hear the word. Without a doubt, right? right. So, yeah, I'm, I was disagreeing with that. Right, yeah. So, um, so James says, right, you see somebody who's, in, who's naked and destitute of daily food, and you walk by them and say, be ye warmed and filled. James says, what have you done? Nothing. Not only did you not help them, but you didn't help them. Right? And, and that's what the calling is to do. And we see here that this king is giving his testimony about some things that have happened to him, George. Well, I thought Kevin may have said he's not interested in other people's testimony, but I find it very interesting when people give their testimony because it tells me a lot about them 
I, I can learn from it. I understand when somebody just saying the same thing over and over. Uh, but when you hear it for the first time, uh, I'm very, I'd sooner hear theirs and probably tell mine. Yeah, they do a better job. Yeah. And in fairness to our elder, he, he didn't say he wasn't interested in anyone else's testimony. He said that people tend not to be interested in ours oh, okay. because they, they've got their own situation. And he very much listens to their story and then patterns something that's well, going to good. work for I, them. Yeah. I'm glad you corrected me because I, I, I knew him. I couldn't understand why he was interested. No worries at all. No worries at all. Yes, sir. I think you're talking about the testimonies over here. Um, you can almost take it a step further as well. You don't necessarily have to share your testimony because uh, worship we're talking about is 24-7. So if you're displaying godly attitude constantly throughout your life, people are going to look at you and realize you're different and they'll want to know what your story is because he doesn't act like everyone else. He doesn't sit there and swear when everyone else is swearing. He doesn't do anything else. So they'll be curious of what makes him tick, and that will open the conversation to share the testimony of God. Without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, however, I mean, whether it's someone reaches out to us or we reach out to them, the goal <laughs> is to share, to share God, right? to share Jesus. We, we absolutely should do that. Any others? Good. So the king is sharing due to an experience that he has with God. And he says so very eloquently. It seems good to me to declare the signs and the wonders which the Most High God has done for me. As king, I'm sending out this tweet saying, here's what the God has done for me. And I want to tell you about it because it seems good for me to do, that is to say, it is a good thing for me to do, to share this information. Whether the good thing is because I believe it can help you, or it's what I owe him for what I have received from him and learned from him, uh, or if it's just in me to express, for whatever reason there is for me to share what God has done for me, I feel that it is a good thing for you to know. So I'm sharing this information with you. He says, how great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. So when, when you look at that, you're, you're just thinking about the, just the, the, the gravity and the immensity and the glory of what he is able to do. Because remember, he's already come into contact with him a couple of times from the first dream and the interpretation thereof, and then the rescue of the three Hebrew boys. He's already come into contact with God. And now he comes into contact with God a third time. And this represents the last, this is Nebuchadnezzar's last story. We'll find that when we get finished here, he passes from the scene. So this is the last thing that we're going to hear from him. And it's quite extensive. It's quite memorable. And it's quite impactful. But what he is doing is, as Desiree said, he's writing this letter due to what has happened to him. So everything that follows is the story. Here's why I'm telling you about God. Here's why I'm telling you what he's done for me. Here's why I'm saying how immense and how wonderful and how majestic he is and how everlasting he is because of what he did for me. I can speak about God because I've met God. I've interacted with God. God has impacted and affected me, and I'm in a position to be able to tell you about what he has done to, for, and with me. And I suggest to, to us, family, that we are in the same position. And however we get to it, should not be shy about doing what the king here is even now doing. Okay? All right. So, he begins his narrative, which resulted in those first three verses. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream, and it made me fearful. 
And these fantasies, as I lay on my bed, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon, and that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Now, you recall that he had a dream before, <laughs> and he wasn't willing to share what the dream was, but he wanted the same people that he's calling now, the Chaldeans, diviners, all these people, come in and tell me what I dreamed and then tell me what it means. We all know how that story went. They couldn't do it. He threatened their lives. Daniel was able to go to God with the help of his Hebrew friends. And God gave him the dream and he gave it and saved everybody and became very famous and well-to-do and highly positioned. So now the king is having a second dream. And he says in verse 7 that the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in and I related the dream to them, right? So now I'm telling you what the dream is. You don't have to guess or discern or intuit what the dream is. I'm telling you, here is what the dream was. But once again, they were unable to make its interpretation known. Now, what do you suppose that is? to appease the king. So with what happened with Daniel before, they probably are hesitant to do that. So when they really don't know what it is, they don't know what it is. And King Nebuchadnezzar is asking them, he's asking people who are not worshiping God. Okay. He's worshiping other gods. Okay. So God is with him, then, but he's with uh, Daniel. Okay. So, 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 he became a bit of a slow learner, right? But, but at the same time, though, the reason that you have these people, these Chaldeans, these diviners, these conjurers, these magicians, is because that's their job, right? That's what they're supposed to be able to do. Their, their, their position in the cabinet is to be able to tell the king things that he does not know, answer questions that he has. To be able to interpret signs, whether they, because the Chaldeans were famous for astrology, uh, those things that are moving in the sky, to be able to read that and say, this is an omen for this, this is an indicator of that, this is a sign of what's to come. So he had that group of people uh, around him for those metaphysical purposes, right? We're all human beings, and we know what it is to live a human life, but we also know what it is to want to know things that are beyond ourselves and beyond the realities that we can see, touch, feel, uh, hear, and taste. Uh, we uh, have this innate curiosity about the supernatural, do we not? Um, and so these guys were employed to deliver that, to give a window, uh, an eye, to those things that are beyond normal perception. Uh, and who knows, perhaps he's asked them different things that they were able to answer. Perhaps they would consult their charts and say, you know, the harvest this year is going to be a bumper crop based on um, this or that movement of this or that celestial body. And maybe uh, it came about, who knows, right? Because if you've got these people on payroll, for as long as he was king, they must be serving some sort of purpose. However, he has this dream, but they're unable to make the interpretation of the dream known. Why? Because this dream came from the God. And the God has a plan. And that plan does not involve in this case, utilizing magicians, conjurers, or Chaldeans, or diviners to interpret what he is saying to the king. God is very much interacting with the king, speaking to the king, telling the king things that he wants him to know. And of course, by extension, he wants the people of Babylon to know. By extension, the people of the world to know. By extension, people for all time to know. Hence, here we are talking about it some four, five, six thousand years after it's happened. The, the possibility exists that also the, the political element of this is real. And so the, these soothsayers and everybody are not just 
potentially important to their king. They're important to the people to know the king has these people that he relies on. And so even if the king is discounting him because of his prior experience, he, he potentially has a political um, issue where he can't be seen as discounting them or marginalizing them. And so it could be he calls them in knowing they're not going to be able to do this. And I, I like to think of it looking at him and going, so you want to tell me the dream interpretation and then that one eyebrow goes up. <laughs> and you remember what happened last time when you didn't get it right? You know, and then he calls Daniel, right? right? And so we tend to forget that there's all kinds of stuff going on here behind Scripture that's just real political stuff, just like that we experience today, right? It'd be like if, the, if our president fired all his advisors. Can you imagine how that would be perceived? Like, wait a minute, wait, those are people that like we trust. Right. And so it's, it's always good to know that kind of, it's speculation, but it's kind of fun speculation to know that stuff's going on in the background. But I, you make a very good point. Kevin, because that, that represents reality. I mean, the Bible contains, I believe, everything that we need to know. But it doesn't contain everything there is to know. So, I mean, Kevin makes a great point about some of the political things that are going on. And, and you folks know I've traveled to Egypt. And, and while, while there, I mean, I learned quite a bit about the sort of backstory that's located right there um, in Scripture. Um, and I think I've shared this with you in the past. I won't go into, into detail on it now. But whenever we think of the concept of hard-hearted, when we think of um, um, Pharaoh and his heart being hardened, there are some things in the religion that they practice that involve the heart. And their concept of heaven and the afterlife and the underworld involve a heart. <laughs> and uh, if, 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 if your heart was heavier than a feather... Uh, then you were going to destruction and some supernatural dog ate the heart and then you went to whatever destruction. But if it was lighter, um, then, then, then you went on to whatever their version of heaven was. And so there was a trans... But what was being... God was using the language that they understood. But we don't have a context for that because we don't know what their religious practices were. And we don't know what their terminology was. And so there's all kinds of things that are underneath the scripture that are part of the culture that we have no access to uh, or connection to. So, I mean, that's, that's great. I think whenever we can bring that stuff in to help us with our understanding, it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, so excellent point. He goes on to say, but finally, you know, after I've called in all these guys to, to, to interpret this dream for me and they couldn't do it, Daniel came in before me. Again, he referred to him as Belshazzar. According to the name of my God, and in whom is a spirit of the holy gods, and I related the dream to him, saying, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. So we know that even though uh, Nebuchadnezzar had experience with Yahweh, uh, he still wasn't kind of a card-carrying member. He, he still wasn't <laughs> drinking the godly fruit of the vine at that point. I, he acknowledged him <laughs> because he really had no choice to, with the way that he's interacted with him before. Um, it, it reminds me, um, well, that's, that's a deviation. He, he just wasn't, he wasn't, willing to embrace him that way, but acknowledge that he existed. But, you know, it's like the Hindus. You talk to them about Jesus, they're like, okay, cool, got it. Right? And then they'll place him among the six million other gods that they have. Right? I, 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 I believe you. I'm convinced that he is who you say he is, and so I'm going to put him right next to Shiva. <laughs> Right? That kind of thing. And so this is what we see in him. He hadn't fully embraced the, that. But that's okay because um, he was being utilized of God. He was part of God's plan. But he does talk about how the holy God was involved with Daniel. Am I looking at that right? Fair enough. All right. So, verse 9. Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians. So he's, he still had that designation, even though he was much more than chief of the magician. As a matter of fact, he was number two in the empire. Uh, but because he distinguished himself as a person who could interpret dreams and even tell dreams, he was considered in the class of these soothsayers, if you will. So since I know 
that a spirit of the Holy Ghost is in you and no mystery <laughs> baffles you. Tell me the vision of my dream, which I have seen along with its interpretation, right? What's the king saying? Let's roll that back. I told them the dream and they couldn't interpret it. But because you're you and because you have a track record, because I know that you have the ability to do this just for me. Tell me what the actual dream was and then tell me what it means. Right? This is what he's saying. Now, these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. What's the king doing in that sentence? Pardon? Exactly. Remember, he's writing a letter. He's communicating with the world. And so what he's doing is telling us, he's telling you and I what the dream was. So the whole thing with Daniel is sort of on hold. So it's like when we watch these television shows when the character doesn't know what we, the audience, knows at that point, right? So I put Daniel to this, but let me just tell you over here that here's what the dream was. I was laying there doing this and that kind of thing, right? And then he's going to go back to Daniel, right? So here's what he says. He says, now, these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong, and its height reached to the sky, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky dwelt in their branches, and all the living creatures fed themselves from it. I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. He shouted out and spoke as follows. Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Hmm. And let him share with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High is a ruler over the realm of mankind and bestow it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. Now, did we understand everything that was said in the dream? I'm not talking about interpreting it at this point, but did, did we get kind of what was going on? Yes. Big tree, right? I think of that tree that was an avatar. Right? That was a great movie. Uh, great tree. Uh, and, and so... It had this presence, and it had this preeminence, and it just seemed that the entire world <coughs> lived because of it, or certainly was benefited by it. But then, of course, the announcement comes along that the tree is to be chopped down. That's interesting. But the stump with its roots were to be left and then circle with an iron and bronze band. It's interesting also in verse 15 that it goes from this stump to in the new grass of the field and let him be drenched with dew of heaven. Well, who's him? We were just talking about a tree, were we not? Those are the kinds of things that I think we should question. When we read the Bible, I mean, let's not just read through it and past it, but if something catches our attention like that, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What just happened here? Why, why, why is that? And of course there's an answer. So he goes on and relates the rest of it. Verse 18, this is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belshazzar, tell me its interpretation. Inasmuch as none of the wise men of my kingdom is able to make known to me the interpretation, but you, 
are able, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. What do you make of that last sentence? Well, it's like you said. He acknowledged God, but he put it with the rest of his gods. Okay. So even though he had had interaction with the one true God, even though he knew about the one true God, he clearly didn't understand the one true God. And so this was one of those things that was, again, of the supernatural realm, of something that was beyond him. Everything that he had ever been taught as a human being had involved gods, had involved multiple gods. You had gods for fertility and gods for war and gods for weather and gods of metal. And so uh, it was difficult for any of these gods to distinguish themselves from amongst the group, let alone be the only one in reality. He had not yet been convinced, even though he had seen and witnessed the power of the God, um, he had not seen and experienced enough to know that one, there aren't any others, and two, that he is the one. So there's still a lot of speaking of and speaking about multiple gods. You're able, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. And so you have someone who just doesn't know any better, doing the best he can with the knowledge that he has. And this isn't new. Remember when Paul was at Mars Hill? And he goes, I've noticed. You guys gather around and talk about these philosophies, and everybody always wants to hear something new. And you know what else I noticed? That you've got a monument to the unknown God that you talk about amongst all the other gods. Because remember, the Greeks were famous for a whole pantheon of gods, were they not? The ones that we know about from Greek mythology, we don't even know all of them, but we know the, the big ones and the main ones, but then there was all kinds of other ones that we don't even know. So they just had gods for everything. And so here you've got this unknown God. It's the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar has done here. And then Paul, of course, expounds on this unknown God and ends up saying at the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now requires men everywhere to repent. And so what we see here then is this God has made an impact on Nebuchadnezzar, which is why he's telling this story. As much as he's talking about these gods, remember the first three verses of chapter four, where he talks about the God. OK. All right. So our time is concluded. We'll pick it up there. But do yourselves a, a favor, family. Go ahead and read more of what goes on. Take a look at verse 19 and the verses following for the interpretation. And let's come back next week and be prepared to discuss that. Thank you.